Good day, everyone. I would say good afternoon, but you may be joining from different time zones uh, around the country and around the world. My name is Neil Roberts, uh, and I teach Africana Studies, Political Theory, and the Philosophy of Religion at Williams College, where I also have the delight and honor to be the director and faculty fellow of uh, the W. Ford Schumann 50 Program in Democratic Studies, who is sponsoring uh, today's event. And it brings me great delight uh, in order to introduce our featured uh, speaker, uh, Dr. Danielle uh, Allen. Danielle Allen is the James Bryant Conant University Professor at Harvard University. And she is a political theorist who has published broadly in democratic theory, political sociology, and the history of political thought. She is the recipient of the 2020 John W. Kluge Prize for Achievement in the Study of Humanities, an award administered by the Library of Congress that recognizes work in disciplines not covered by the Nobel Prizes. Widely known for her work on justice and citizenship in both ancient Athens and modern America, Allen is the author of The World of Prometheus, The Politics of Punishment, uh, punishing in Democratic Athens, Talking to Strangers, Anxieties of Citizenship Since Brown v. Board of Education, Why Plato Wrote, Our Declaration, A Reading of the Declaration of Independence in Defense of Equality, and Cuz, The Life and Times of Michael A., among many other monographs and co-edited books. She is a former chair of the Mellon Foundation Board, past chair of the Pulitzer Prize Board, and a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the American Philosophical Society. Dr. Allen has chaired numerous commission processes and is a lead author on many influential policy roadmaps, including pursuing excellence uh, on a foundation of inclusion. And she was for many years a contributing columnist for the Washington Post and writes for the Atlantic. Allen, is also the founding director for the Democratic Knowledge Project Design Studio, which emerged from the Democratic Knowledge Project, a distributed research and action lab at Harvard University. And most recently, Alan was uh, a candidate for governor in the state of Massachusetts. And on a personal note, um, uh, I've greatly learned from uh, Dr. Allen uh, since we met uh, in the city of Chicago. Uh, I'll say the early 2000s, um, and, uh, and since then um, uh, continue to learn, uh, and I'm delighted that we're able to host Daniel Allen for uh, this new book event today. I just wanna make a few announcements before, uh, before we begin. The first is that um, we at the Schumann Program wanted to be able to extend what we discussed today with um, those members of our community. And as such, um, we were able to uh, acquire 150 copies of uh, the book I'm just going to show now <laughs> um, uh, by Daniel Allen, uh, Democracy in the Time of Coronavirus. And so for those of you not just connected to Williams College, but who are kind of members of the community, um, those uh, books are currently, uh, as of today, available in the Williams Bookstore. Uh, and Daniel Allen graciously was kind enough to sign copies of those books, so please, uh, if you don't already have a copy, uh, we welcome you to uh, acquire them again at the Williams Bookstore. Secondly, um, uh, in real time, uh, we have closed captioning available. Uh, and so if you wish uh, to have that closed captioning, either at the bottom of your computer screen or whichever device you're using, uh, if you click on the live transcript icon at the bottom, uh, you should be able to see that closed captioning. We also very much welcome uh, questions from the audience. And so uh, if, again, at the bottom of your computer or whichever device you are on, uh, we welcome your questions. And so if you could use the Q&A icon, uh, then we'll be able to pull those questions uh, and either be able to read them individually uh, or collect them together uh, in order to have answered. And last but not least, in terms of uh, format, uh, we're going to begin uh, with approximately 20 minutes of uh, background framing uh, by Dr. Allen for uh, this latest book and then have a conversation um, for around the same amount of time, uh, some of which I imagine will emerge based on those opening remarks and some uh, questions uh, that I know I have and others may have 
uh, regarding the book and also the context of um, our COVID moment. Uh, and then um, and then really offer the remaining time to uh, have input by you, the audience. And so I've said enough already. Thank you all for joining us. And, um, uh, and I'll turn it over to Daniel Allen to uh, say a bit of framing for our book and discussion um, today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Roberts. Neil, it's a pleasure to be here with you again. It's true, we have had the pleasure of knowing each other for quite some time now, um, starting out at the University of Chicago. And it's just wonderful to be able to join you with your community here at Williams College. And thank you, Carrie and Steve for your support of this event. And I know also I've got, I think a few friends um, who've come out, Arlene, I'm so thrilled that you're here. Thank you so much for joining and welcome everybody for this conversation. It's, it's a real pleasure. I am gonna tell the story of the book, really talk about where it came from and what some of the core themes are, uh, some of the challenges I think that we all need to face together as we pass beyond the worst of the COVID moment and start to understand ourselves in a world where we're living with um, COVID and living with a different kind of physical vulnerability going forward. But the truth is, that the book for me, I mean, it, it has a deep origin um, in my, my own life and journey. My sense of the state of our affairs in our country being quite bleak dates back till 2009. And I know some of you know this personal story of mine, but in 2009, I lost my younger cousin, Michael. And Michael was somebody I grew up with. He was probably the first baby I ever held when he was born in 1979. I was a lonely kid being bullied on the school playground that year. And then my aunt delivered a ready-made new best friend. And Michael was a bright kid with a lively mind full of curiosity. And we grew up together. But then in 1995, when he was 15 and I was a few years out of college, he was arrested on a first arrest in Southern California for an attempted carjacking. And this was a terrible thing to have done. It was also though the time in California when punishment was at its most intense. And on that first arrest, Michael got a sentence of 12 years and eight months. And from the age of 15, he served 12 of those years. And then um, when Michael got out, I was what I always call cousin on duty. So I was trying to help him put the pieces back together of housing and school and jobs and the like. And Michael had had two years out, two years of freedom at the point in 2009 when he was shot and killed by somebody he had met while he was in prison. And up until that point in 2009, I'd always had a sort of mixed view, a picture of dark and light about the state of affairs in our country, um, a sense of many things that were open and possible and great accomplishments, and also a sense of difficulties and trials and tribulations. But when I lost Michael, that was a point for me where I just became intently focused on how bleak and bad life had become for so many people and especially communities of color. And I really put all my energy into the question of how to spring us from this trap that we had gotten into. And that was true in my scholarly work. It was true across the board of what I was doing. And I came to Harvard in 2015 um, to take the lead, the directorship of a center there called the Edmund J. Safford Center for Ethics. And as I came into that role, it was also a point in time where I was reading a new report just came out from the National Academies of Sciences. And this report was written by all kinds of distinguished people, people like Jeremy Travis, who does a lot of grant making funding for the Arnold Foundation in criminal justice by Bruce Western, one of the leading scholars in the field um, and 25 or so people, all the most distinguished in their fields. The title of the report was the cause and consequences of mass incarceration. And throughout this report, what they did was just, they scrub all the data, all the evidence. Why were we where we were incarcerating more people than any society in the history of humanity has ever incarcerated. And they looked at economic data, and they looked at demographic changes in birth rates and questions of education and job opportunity. And they looked at the consequences to health and to community and to well-being. They looked at the experiences of victims as well as the experiences of offenders and the like. And they scrubbed the whole thing. But then in this very voluminous and thorough report, there was this very unusual chapter 12, the last chapter trying to make sense of, of why we were where we were in this story of causes and consequences. And in chapter 12, what they said was, well, you know, one of the reasons we are where we are with mass incarceration is because for decades, 
nobody has asked basic questions of ethics. What's punishment for anyways? What is justice? What should the ethical guardrails of punishment be? Instead of asking these questions for the last 30 years, we had just been rinsing and repeating a very retributivist deterrent paradigm for punishment. And so for me, this report was just this incredibly powerful moment where all these empirical social scientists were saying, the reason we've screwed up is because we forgot to ask questions of ethics. And here I was coming in to lead an ethics center. And so I thought, this is it, this is our job. Our job is to bring questions of ethics, questions of justice back into the disciplines of the social sciences, back into policymaking, so we can actually start getting right some of the things that we're doing with the tools of the public sector, with the tools of government, with the tools of the state. So I joined the center and we built a program called Justice, Health and Democracy. And the basic goal of this program was to start trying to move people away from a criminalizing approach to so many social challenges and to build the capacity to bring a health and public health approach instead. So we built this group and that meant we were putting together people from the medical school and from public health school and from the law school and the policy school as well as social scientists, but making sure that ethicists, people focused on questions of justice, of well-being, of what's good for human beings were at the center of the conversation. And this work was moving forward. We are doing work on things like decriminalization and, and other aspects of responding to substance use disorder. And then COVID hit. And when COVID hit, right from the get-go, I had a deep sense of shock at how different impacts were for different communities. In the beginning, there was just the simple fact that sitting inside Harvard, I had access to all kinds of knowledge about what was happening and what the shape of this disease was going to be, that I could see that people outside of universities just did not have access to. And that felt as deeply wrong to me as the other kinds of traps I had seen people get caught in over time and particularly communities of color. And sure enough, as the pandemic began to unfold, we saw those with means retreating to Zoom rooms like this as we all were so fortunate as to be able to do, but then others, especially working people being pushed back to work without access to testing and PPE and the impacts were devastating. So mortality rates much higher for communities of color than other people and mainly because People of color were working in frontline workers um, out there without access to the protection that they needed. And so in the midst of this, in this sort of real disparity of experience, the group that we'd built, the Justice, Health and Democracy Group, pivoted to do work on COVID. And the very first thing we did, our first contribution in early March of 2020 was an ethical contribution. We were, as a country, paralyzed in a debate about you know, did we need to protect the economy or did we need to protect people's lives? And people just started with this assumption that there's a sort of trade-off between protecting the economy and protecting people's lives. And we said, no, it's not a trade-off, in fact. You can't have healthy people without a healthy economy and you can't have a healthy economy without healthy people. So the actual decision-making job, the work to do here is about how to find a pathway where we can align the job of protecting lives and protecting liberties and protecting livelihoods. We can actually do these things together. We have to figure out what the pathway to that is. And that led our group to um, laying out a policy roadmap to really build up the public infrastructure of testing and contact tracing. And then we put in just sort of huge amounts of time and effort trying to drive that policy paradigm, working with the White House, working with both houses of Congress, working with governors all around the country, with mayors, all around the country and the like. And so the book tells the story of that effort and it tells the story of the lessons learned from it. So as I said, before COVID hit, I already had a pretty bleak view of where things were for us in the country and the challenges we faced. And I will say that the effort to drive forward sound policy in response to the pandemic did bring me to a bleaker view about where we found ourselves. So the book traces out some of those challenge areas. And then in the end, in the final chapter called A Transformed Peace, um, it seeks to sketch a direction forward where we can go in the future. So let me just say something about the bleak view and then something about the, the forward path. Um, and then I will be delighted to transition over to conversation. 
So there are a number of points in the bleak view, and I won't dwell on them at great length, just to, to name them for the most part, um, and then come around to the forward path. But for starters, there were just tremendous failures of leadership, and the era there points directly at former President Trump, and I don't think I need to belabor that point. Um, there's a lot to be said though about the specifics of the kind of leadership failure that we witnessed, and so I spend some time on that. Um, and then there were failures of knowledge, real problems with how we use knowledge in our society, how it operates. For starters, it was really shocking to me to discover in May, working with members of Congress, sitting in meetings with members of Congress, that they were still learning in May things that I had learned in late February and early March. Now, it would be reasonable for ordinary people going about their lives in business to be still learning those things in May. There's always a kind of time lag between what university researchers are so fortunate as to be able to learn and understand and what others learn and understand. But for members of Congress shaping COVID policy to be only in May learning things about the incubation period of the disease and the like, that's a serious problem. And what it drove home for me was um, the impact of something many people are not aware of. But in the early 1990s, in the first phase of our huge partisan and polarized fights in Congress, the Newt Gingrich Congress stripped Congress of its own funding, the funding that it used to secure a research staff and research personnel. So in the ensuing 25 years, Congress's capacity to just master the content of the issues that it faces has diminished significantly. And we really felt the force of that um, in the time of working on COVID policy. But there's another way in which we had a serious knowledge problem in, in, in facing COVID. And this one will come as a bit more of a surprise, I think, to uh, folks on this call. Um, you'll know we, we all sort of settled into the pattern of saying, trust the science, follow the science, trust the science, follow the science. This is actually not the right approach to expertise and advice and its use in policymaking. At the end of the day, science can tell us how to do things, but it can't tell us what to do. The question of what our purpose is, what our objective is, is not one that science can answer. So coming back to that first point I made about you know, we made the case that there was not a trade-off between health and the economy. In fact, we could align these things. That framework for decision-making is an ethical framework. It's a normative framework that helps us think about how we should prioritize what our core values should be that anchor all decision-making. So we need science for sure. And we should have great respect for the hard work that science does to secure an evidentiary base for our understanding but at the end of the day, what we need is for science to advise leaders who are in the position to make synthetic judgments, connecting judgments about our purposes to the specifics of how we're actually going to act on those purposes. So we have a real challenge in front of us for how to cultivate political leaders who not alone, but in partnership with others and in partnership with the broader public can actually make the case that this is a moment for judgment. There's a, there are judgments that have to be made. We can articulate the questions that have to be judged. What is the, the, the what for question? What is the question about our purpose that we need to answer in order to know how to marshal the tools of science to deliver on that? So that's another place where we saw ultimately flaws in how in this society we bring knowledge into the process we use for our public decision-making. But now having talked for one minute about leadership, just pointing to President Trump as an example of the failures there. And then for another moment about knowledge, let me talk about the third real area of challenge that I came face to face with um, in doing the COVID work. When my team got started and we got started laying out the roadmap to pandemic resilience where we made the case for the testing infrastructure and mapped out how supply chains could be structured to try to achieve it and deliver it and the like. I, I quote a colleague of mine, a scientist, a very distinguished scientist, um, one of the top leaders in the relevant fields of, of biotechnology, who said to me early in the pandemic, as we were working together to sketch out um, this testing infrastructure, he said, 
you know, Danielle, there's no laws of physics that have to be broken to get this done for the whole country, to have testing infrastructure at scale for the whole country to turn this pandemic into something that we can control and manage and minimize the damage of. And early in those days in March, I think it probably was when he said this to me, I sort of nodded and said, yes, okay, that's right. There's no law of physics that needs to be broken. So we can get this done. We're going to get out there and make the case for the policy and persuade people, bring them on board and, and drive this change. What I came to understand, though, over the course of time doing the work on COVID and watching as the policies that we argued for, first of all, got completely caught up and tangled up in the electoral contest between Trump and Biden as they were competing for who was gonna put their name on which parts of the policy. And then the policies got tangled up in the fights between Democrats and Republicans in Congress and fights about voting rights and fights about COVID got completely intermixed with each other in ways that meant that COVID policy didn't move for six months between May and the late fall. I watched all of that and I came to understand that in fact, there were laws of physics that had to be broken to get COVID policy done. The, those laws of physics were actually showing up as laws of politics. The law of politics that had to be broken was that the, in conditions of distrust and division, everything moves slower by definition. So physics is about time and temporality. And the question of the degree of trust or distrust you have in a society affects the temporality of decision-making. So it turned out there were laws of physics that had to be broken. We couldn't actually move COVID policy forward any faster than we could create trust to move those policies forward. And therefore nothing could happen any faster than trust could be generated out of conditions of distrust and division. So at the end of the day, my book ends up focusing most of all on this question, the problem of our division, the problem of our lack of solidarity, the question of how it is we can get to a place where we can actually create a new social contract, a social contract in which all will recognize that although things are asked of them, responsibilities are put on them, their rights are protected, they are protected and a new social contract in which we can recognize that our well-being, my well-being, is very closely connected to the well-being of others. And it's something that we need to pitch on, pitch in on together with one another. So one of the really striking things about our COVID experience, I think, in the spring of 2020 was just that it drove home the point that you know, in conditions of emergency, it turned out, you know, we weren't all going to be okay. We couldn't count on each other. And the really important underlying point is that this was true because we were already in a state where we can't count on each other. So in that regard, the case I'm making in the book is that our single deepest political challenge is the one of how we actually achieve a new social contract where we do pull each other into a sense of moral connection with one another. I believe we face a moral challenge in the country right now to achieve that sense of bonds of connectedness, solidarity, and mutual commitment. I make the case at the end of the book for an approach, a policy approach that I think points in this direction. It is the policy approach I try to exhibit and embody in running my gubernatorial campaign. And there's lots more to be said about that. But if you if you pick up the book and read nothing else, I hope you will read the last chapter, a chapter called An Agenda for Healing Our Social Contract. Um, I, I, I speak there about what it would mean for us to make sure that we are committed to all members of our community, to the elderly, to the young, both abandoned in profound ways over the course of the pandemic. We have the third highest mortality rate in our elder care facilities in Massachusetts. Um, as you know, young people with the experience of COVID in schools have just suffered immensely in ways that we haven't reckoned with. So how do we move past that you know, too easy um, willingness to let those kinds of abandonment happen? Similarly for communities of color, for rural people as well. Um, so we have a lot of work to do to name the fact that we don't have these commitments to one another and to articulate in concrete ways what would count as establishing a new kind of commitment to one another. So that's what the book's about. Um, I'm sure that was a lot to take in, um, but I'm so grateful to all of you for your time and the chance to share it with you.
Thank you very much, uh, Danielle, and right on time in terms of um, kind of transitioning to a conversation. And so uh, for those who are joining us before the opening remarks, uh, we really welcome any questions you may have. And so uh, whichever device you're tuning in uh, from, uh, if you wish to submit questions in the Q&A icon, we'll hopefully be able to um, have those posed after the conversation. So um, Danielle, given what you mentioned uh, in your opening remarks, which was partially about the book, but also um, some of the questions, particularly from 2009 and 2015 to the onset of the pandemic that in some sense shaped the, you know, uh, kind of shaped this text. I have more questions than I know I can ask you, but the first um, is something I was struck by is that in the book, you focus very much on the first few months of uh, of 2020. Uh, and so could you say a bit about why you focus on those months, especially because the project that you mentioned um, that you were the lead uh, director, you've been the lead director for that issued many white papers in real time. Um, after those months, um, if you could maybe tell us why not all of the book, but um, a notable um, portion of it is dedicated to those um, early months. Uh, I'd be very curious. Uh, why you decided to do that. Yeah, and no, I appreciate that. I mean, in some sense, that was the accident of circumstance. So, but well prior to the onset of the pandemic, I had been scheduled to give a series of lectures at the University of Chicago in May of 2020. And of course the pandemic hit, everybody was trying to figure out what to do. I ended up being the first virtual lecturer that the University of Chicago hosted. They, they chose to go forward with the lectures and asked me to do it that way. And at that time in May of 2020, it seemed there was really nothing one could talk about other than what we were all wrestling with. So I took the occasion to basically give a report from the field on what the work we were doing, what we were learning and so forth. And so, um, you know, it'll be a long time before all the histories of the pandemic are written. But I truly had um, a front row seat. I mean, you know, I had very bizarre experiences like standing in my closet and getting cell phone calls from Jared Kushner as an example. Mm -hmm. And so I thought I had an obligation to try to record what I had seen and experienced um, as a part of this process. And um, so in that regard, it was hard to write the book because I knew it would come out at a point when the actual conditions of the pandemic had changed dramatically. Um, <laughs> Sorry, my dog is, you can probably hear my dog in the background. Let me just let my dog out. Yeah. Sorry about that. At any rate, I knew the conditions would be different by the time the book came out, um, but I thought the best thing I could do was try to figure out what larger themes I could lift out of the circumstances I'd experienced and try to bring attention to those even while also capturing and recording the actual experiences of those early months. Yeah, um, <clears throat> that's really helpful and, and really also trying to expand on some of your um, kind of opening remarks. Um, I was particularly struck about how you, um, write about education in, uh, in the book. And in particular, an issue that I think is still in real time uh, an ongoing one and has been controversial, not just in the United States, in Canada, all around the world, is um, the nature of having our uh, children and also students in classrooms. Um, the period during the pandemic, uh, once lockdown was happening all across uh, the world, when uh, should schools reopen? Should schools be opening virtually? Should there be hybrid learning? Uh, what did it mean to try and bring uh, young people who were not eligible for vaccinations into schools? Um, uh, and you mentioned now, uh, even in speaking of the state of Massachusetts, uh, not just colleges and universities, but also in different states all across the United States and in different areas around the world, mass mandates are, are, are shifting and lifting. Um, even though we don't necessarily know if there will be different variants or not. So um, in the book, you do actually address, at least my reading of the book, you do address, um, even in those early months of 2020, what should be 
the approach to education because it's still a front one. So I was hoping whether it's about what you wrote in the book or just your views um, about the nature of having uh, our young people and also students of various ages uh, at different levels of education in person, virtual, hybrid, you know, how should we um, kind of think about this uh, in general? Yes, I mean, you know, it's all, it's been hard for every family um, in the country and everybody connected to schools, every educator. I mean, my own kids, of course, did lots of, you know, second grade, they were in second grade and fourth grade when the pandemic hit. So did those kind of critical years um, through this COVID experience. Um, and I watched my daughter have very significant mental health impacts through the first year of the pandemic. I watched my son be quite happy, but have his academic engagement really precipitously decline. So, and this was, you know, in a family where we had a babysitter on hand um, to help with school and the like. So the impacts were profound everywhere um, across the board and continue to be. And it'll be a long time honestly before we've fully taken the measure of it. I mean, I think, you know, researchers are trying in various ways to understand all the impacts. And this is one of the great challenges is that um, science actually can't deliver, and this is a hard thing, actionable intelligence. By actionable intelligence, I mean what you need to make a judgment in real time with you know, children right in front of you who are suffering now. And honestly, we won't know for three years what the full impacts of the pandemic have been on kids, but we need to figure out now what the right thing for them is. I think at the end of the day, um, two things for me really come out of the pandemic. One, that um, those schools that succeeded for kids and succeeded in helping them walk through these hard times um, really did that by being able to personalize learning. And we actually have known for a long time that the more that you can support multiple pathways to success, the more that you can personalize learning for students, the better you will do for students. So I feel like that is a kind of little gem in all of this difficulty that we need to focus on and figure out how to, to build from and grow more personalization into our K through 12 system generally. Yeah. In that regard, I think similarly that we have to accept virtual technologies is here to stay. Not that kids should be living online in you know, long-term ways because it's, it's really not good for most kids, um, but it should be a tool in the toolkit that gives us flexibility and alternatives so that we can build learning structures that are good um, for all kids. And then in terms of the pandemic itself, I mean, I think one of my um, greatest sort of senses of frustration is there's no, you know, final answer on this. It's not as if, you know, I'm looking, yes, masks are off now for sure. We are likely to have a surge in the fall. We are likely to have another variant at some point in time. The odds that we will have to say it's time to bring the emergency public health measures back out of the toolkit for a period of a surge, the odds of that are pretty high. So we should all expect that we'll, there will be a time where we're masking again, you know, more regularly and things like that. But then when the surge recedes, we can take those masks away. But how do you actually live in a world like that? You've got to empower people locally. You've got to have school leaders empowered, educators and school health personnel empowered to understand and make the right decisions in their contexts. And th that's something I argued for consistently throughout our COVID policy works sort of empowerment of local teams, investment to, for increased health personnel in schools and the like. Um, and I still feel like I'm hitting my head against a brick wall on that one. So yeah. I'm gonna figure it out, but there's a lot more work to do. Yeah. Well, given your last remark, um, I believe it's the third chapter titled Federalism is an Asset. So I'll just turn it over to you. If you could say a bit more about it because it sounds like where you just ended, um, you know, you you try and invite readers to um, really take a look more at federalism and what you even go to the root of the of the word. So if you could just say um, a bit about that. Absolutely, yes. No, I appreciate your raising that chapter because I think if there's a particularly original chapter in the book, it's that one. Um, it makes the most distinctive contribution and it basically makes the argument that federalism is of value. Often we think that our very complex federal structure is the problem and it is the reason that we can't get things done. Um, in fact, 
you know, if we knew how to operate it, it's a very flexible structure that does permit that empowerment of people locally so that knowing context, they can then act on that knowledge, build legitimacy within their community to drive something forward. You have to though have a kind of approach to federalism where the goal is to harmonize efforts at the different levels, federal, state, and local. And right now in our politics, we sort of swing between two you know, points of view at either end of a spectrum, right? You've got on the right-hand side, the conservative side, the view that you know federalism means just like let states do whatever they want to do, which was never the original conception. And to the point of the etymology, you know, it comes from the Latin word for a tie or a bond of faith, basically a tie or a bond. And so the whole point is that you're not just letting people do anything at all. You've actually um, formed a compact together so that you can can do things together through those bonds of, of faith. Um, so at any rate, that's but on the one hand we have that view: let states do whatever they want. Then on the, the left side of the balance, we have the view that really we should just let, let the federal government do everything. Let's like put everything at the level of the federal government. We've got sort of a really big state picture of how to get things done. And I think that there's another way, which is to see that you know, it's this remarkable thing that lets us harmonize um, you know, a capacity to fulfill functions that can only be fulfilled at a national level. So for example, in COVID, you cannot handle um, the data surveillance that you need around the disease, other than at the national level. You've got to bring that up to a national level. Um, but you can't figure out ventilation in schools unless you've got specific teachers telling you, the windows in my classroom are nailed shut. You know, there's no way I can open my windows. And so you need a structure that puts the right function at the right levels, but then harmonizes um, among those levels to work in a shared direction towards a common purpose. Yeah, that's actually really helpful. Um, and if you don't mind me kind of following up um, with you on this, which is that um, you, you outlined for us in the beginning, you know, it's kind of bleak view and then also view, um, thinking about a view um, or a path forward. And I, I was curious to kind of hear from you, not so much just the bleak view, but at the both federal and also kind of state and local levels in terms of paths forwards, are there kind of specific systems or districts that you think actually have been a really great model for how we should be addressing um, uh, the pandemic or I hesitate to say post pandemic, even the yeah. American Political Science Association has a meeting next fall that's kind of post pandemic politics as if we're, we're kind of moving beyond it, which I'm not so sure that's actually um, what's going on, but, um, but there are certain models about a path, um, a path forward, because as you mentioned, even with education, there may be different um, public health measures that actually require us to return to some of the toolkits that may have been eased. So mm -hmm. is there any kind of district, not just merely from the federal government standpoint, but also um, at the kind of state and local level or province level in polities like Canada or, or, or elsewhere? So out of just out of curiosity. Sure. Um, I mean, I, I can point to some examples, but maybe I'll actually just also draw some examples from other countries um, yeah, for the moment. Um, so both Germany and Australia have federal systems, and both were able to operate their federal systems far more effectively than we were. Um, and it, it might be one thing that one might say is, is part of the issue is they're younger. They're not as creaky. They don't have as many um, built up veto points and choke points as we have. And there's truth to that. And it's, that's the thing that we should all sort of um, think about with some concern. Basically, as just one example, right at the very onset of the pandemic in February, Germany ensured that all of its local public health offices had new computers <laughs> already, and that they all had the same data systems and data infrastructure. So that meant that from the beginning, the national government in Germany could see what was going on, could know what was happening. We, to this day, do not have either of those things. We have public health offices that continue to send their data in by fax that somebody then has to you know, manually transcribe and so forth. And um, many public health offices that don't even have the rudimentary equipment of you know currently functioning computers that they need and so forth to do their work. So um, that's the German example. In the Australian case, what the Australian government did 
um, was right from the get-go form um, a cross-party cabinet. Um, so the top leadership of the country pulled together leaders from each of the states across party lines and said, as a cross-party group, we are going to stay together and lead through this all the way through. I think that's literally unimaginable for us in this country right now. And I think we really have to sort of pause and think about how it has come to be that that is unimaginable and what we might do about it. Um, because I do think, it, especially in time of crisis, um, above all, uh, it ought to be possible to pull together that kind of cross-party leadership group to work together um, through a crisis. So those, those would be two examples. Yeah. Um, and before, because we do want to um, kind of soon be able to um, take questions from those who are joining, but um, uh, you know, you did um, kind of mention not only the, the ways in which in your opening that um, the pandemic has asymmetrically affected um, communities of color in certain and also communities in different groups, um, not the same way. So uh, I was wondering if you could say uh, a bit more a bit more about that, especially in terms of thinking about the path forward, because one thing that kind of strikes me, and it's not merely just uh, in the case of the United States, um, but um, but after the kind of the murder of George Floyd and different social movements, the movement for Black Lives in the U.S., but also uh, across the world, South Africa, Great Britain, <laughs> many other countries around the world were also Williamstown. Uh, yeah, Williamstown, you know, as 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 uh, as the thinker Diva Woodley mentioned, uh, has came to a reckoning at the same moment that um, the pandemic um, kind of hit us and are still trying to kind of reckon with not only questions of anti-Black racism and structural injustice, um, but also uh, certain interlocking issues that have um, emerged at the same time, currently now in terms of the, uh, in terms of with the Ukraine. We're still in the midst of trying to figure out the pandemic while then now a war is going on in, in other parts of the world, Ethiopia, et cetera. And so, um, yeah, just, how should we approach thinking about the um, about COVID when, as you mentioned, science can help us have information, but then there need to be leaders who make decisions. But also going on at the same time are other sets of social and political issues that um, that 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 have emerged or are kind of continuing or amplifying. And so, you know, um, what might you say uh, to those who are trying to think about um, the, the kind of the asymmetric impact of COVID that has a lot to do with kind of uh, structural issues uh, mm -hmm. or social conditions rather than merely um, how a virus impacts us um, uh, kind of as a whole. There are these other issues that do seem like they um, have impacts to certain individuals and communities. So what, what should we kind of think about as we're trying to reckon with all of this. Yeah, no, I appreciate that question. And I, I recognize in it um, the experience that so many of us have had of just life feeling overwhelming. And um, for the reason that you've said, so many things to reckon with, so many profound challenges, structural challenges. And at the same time that life feels overwhelming, um, also then there is the sort of anxiety that um, public officials will focus on only one overwhelming piece and disregard other overwhelming pieces that are no less important. And so how on earth do we find our way through that? And I think that's where I come back to the point I was trying to make about leadership and judgment. Mm. And um, we, we all crave answers. We crave a solution. Uh, well, we can't have that. Um, these are extremely hard things that we're trying to navigate our way through. So what we really need is to make sure that the people who have responsibility for guiding and shaping our collective choices have the right principles at the start. So those are anti-racist principles as one example. We need to know our leaders are committed to anti-racism. We need to know our leaders are committed to seeing all of us, um, seeing the whole of our society and understanding that their job is, I always use the vocabulary of knitting together, um, of knitting us together across uh, lines of difference of experience. I mean, for me, that was just one of the hardest parts of the beginning of the pandemic was just sort of how blatantly it was the case that the people who held power 
weren't seeing the terrible things that were happening to people without power. So then for me, a third principle alongside the first two that's fundamental is, you know, and Ayanna Presley always says this best, right? The people closest to the, the pain should be closest to the power. So it's basically a principle of full inclusion and participation and decision-making. So for me, what we really need is leadership that starts with those three principles at its core. Um, and if we have that, I believe we can navigate our way even through these very overwhelming crises. Wonderful. Thank you, uh, Danielle. And so for um, those of you who are um, still with us, uh, uh, we really welcome your questions now. Um, and so if uh, you wish to ask a question, if you could please uh, submit your question in the Q&A icon at the bottom uh, of your screen, uh, and we'll hopefully try and get to all of the questions that are um, posed. Uh, we do have uh, one question in the queue. This comes from uh, uh, Professor Hari Ramesh. And it reads, uh, Professor Allen, thanks so much for this presentation and for writing this book. I'm curious how, if at all, your understanding of how information, especially complex scientific information, disseminates across our political community, uh, um, if they've disseminated across our political communities, has it changed? And how should we alter our inherited theories of this to better realize our democracy? Yeah. You know, we're all swimming in seas of information and we are all watching as our world is distorted by so much misinformation and disinformation. So that's a really important question. And um, you know, here I think it's really important for us to see a bigger phenomenon that's expected, that's really affecting our experience. Um, I'll just share a story that um, I hope brings this out. So I, as Neil mentioned, um, spent a, many years as a contributing columnist to the Washington Post, Oops, sorry. Um, and that had included uh, writing a lot of columns in 2015 and 2016, arguing against the election of uh, then candidate um, Donald Trump. I thought he was a bad candidate, thought he'd be a bad president, I didn't miss words and wrote lots of columns on that subject. And the result was I got sort of slew of hate stuff, voicemails, emails, tweets and the like, um, you know, images of nooses and gas ovens and so forth. And the volume was such that it was affecting me. It was, you know, it was anonymous, especially the stuff coming in over Twitter and, you know, leading me to sort of like feel uncomfortable moving around the world, you know, outside of my own home with a sort of sense of like, you know, who are the people who hate me? Like I can't, I mean, which of these faces out there are the ones who hate me? I don't know which ones it is and the like. And it was impacting me enough that I asked a friend of mine to do some analysis for me of where the tweets were coming from. And the really startling result of that was to discover that most of it was coming from Eastern Europe, all right? And this was before the reports came out about the Russian disinformation campaign, the official intelligence studies and the like. So we were more or less uncovering some of that ahead of when it all became more public. Um, but the point of saying all of this is that um, there is a kind of active, global community, some of it connected um, to Russia, um, that is proactively seeking to break this country through purveying misinformation and using misinformation to stir up division. So we're vulnerable to that because we have plenty of our own division already. We have problems of structural racism and structural injustice. So there's a lot to tap into in terms of doing that. But the reason I'm answering the question in this way is just because and um, we need to recognize that our information ecosystem is not a natural fact. It does, it's not just, you know, whatever it sort of happens to be because of our media tools and resources. Um, political actors with political purposes are proactively trying to create an information environment that will be destructive of democracy. So as we think about how we want to repair our information environment, we need to actually do it with that recognition in mind. As we wait for some additional uh, questions, um, perhaps connected to um, the last one in the response, um, you do write about uh, the nature of constitutional democracies. You know, what, what do we mean by not just a democracy, but a constitutional uh, democracy? And, uh, and in your remarks, earlier remarks, you talked about both distrust and trust. So um, given not only um, 
campaigns of disinformation, uh, but also um, in your sense of how we should be thinking about uh, kind of COVID's impact on constitutional democracies and, and forging trust, um, how do we, you know, how do we, how do we, how do we do that? How do we sustain those um, interrelated projects? One of the things I think is helpful is to be able to find um, sources of hope and sources of encouragement. So we spend so much time watching and tracking our national politics, which is so bitter um, and divided. But I also like to call our attention to what has happened with ballot propositions around the country in recent years. Where and Neil, you know, we've talked about this before, but where where people are actually able to achieve supermajority votes um, for things that really do sort of signal um, a healthy moral compass. So, for example, um, in Massachusetts in 2020, when we passed the right to repair ballot proposition um, by more than 70 percent, right? This was the ballot proposition giving um, smaller auto shops access to the data uh, in cars so that they can continue to compete with big companies or um, I always also like to point to the ballot proposition in Florida um, in 2018 that restored um, voting rights to people who have completed their felony convictions. Now, the Florida Republican Party in the legislature has undermined that. The people, however, chose that direction. And so that's where I think the work is to be done. You know, the people, you know, is capable at a supermajority level of achieving, um, you know, sort of morally sound decisions. Um, the party, um, associations and organizations are, you know, trying to turn the dynamics in a different direction. So in that regard, for me, the question of how um, we achieve a sort of rebuilding, or I mean, I don't say rebuilding, but sort of a 21st century building for the first time of meaningful and durable, healthy relationships of trust um, is really one about how we um, change the dynamics around parties, um, you know, because I think we, they, we are currently trapped in a set of dynamics being driven by those national organizations. I have many questions, but I do want to, I, 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 I see people in it here. So um, if anyone wishes to kind of add any questions, we really welcome them. Um, you know, Danielle, as we're waiting for additional questions, I mean, is there anything that, um, you didn't say in your either opening remarks or any comments that you really want us to actually take uh, take away again not just the book but the actual um the the kind of the topic why we're here um today to um discuss is there like what do you most want to impart to everyone at the yeah let's call it a sense of urgency right because this is um a sense of urgency i mean you dedicate um the book at the time it says dedicated to the more than 600,000 Americans dead from COVID-19. That number since your manuscript was done, um, uh, sadly, even bloomed. It almost seems like a surreal, um, a surreal number. So there, I, I do believe there is, there is a sense of urgency in what we're talking about. And um, I mean, what do you most want us to discuss among ourselves? Because you do talk about not just purpose, but common mm -hmm. purpose. And so, you know, could yeah. you- let me speak to that a little bit. I will say, I mean, I'm going to say two things. One is a, a simple one, although, and there, but it may be something to talk about, which is that I think we need a COVID memorial in Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and I wonder what it would be like to have the public conversations to try to achieve that. Um, but then I think we also just collectively need a new social contract. And in the book, I really um, point to five things that we need in particular. Um, one is to um, restore the idea that, um, you know, taxation in order to invest in the people of our community is good. Um, and we need to sort of break out of the paradigm we've been in for 30 years at this point, where by definition, taxes are bad. Um, so that's, that's one piece. And that doesn't mean all taxes, but, but you know, smart taxes. Um, absolutely. We need to rebuild that concept of something, well, Commonwealth, I'm always talking about that, a Commonwealth, right, that was about our shared investment um, in the foundation of healthy communities. So that's sort of one part um, of a new social contract. 
Um, but the second part of a new social contract, I would say, is also to recognize that we really need um, cross-sectoral um, collaboration. So we need that public sector, as I've just said, and we need our civil society organizations, but I think we do also need um, what market um, organizations, um, firms um, can offer us. So I think it really is a sort of, it's a picture of three parts pulling together, um, the public sector, civil society, nonprofit organizations, and businesses, market organizations. Um, that's a different picture, you know, again, you know, in our political landscape, we're sort of split between the one side that thinks, um, you know, all we need is the market, and then the other side that thinks all that we need is a big state. Um, and I actually think it's really important to call out that we need all three sectors and we need to figure out how to have them work dynamically and productively in relationship to each other. Um, so, you know, a third thing I would point to is um, we need to change the incentive um, systems that are giving us these parties that are um, sowing so much division. So I'm a real advocate of things like ranked choice voting, for example, as a part of that, that would be a third part of a new social contract I would point to. Um, and then in terms of our sort of daily politics, those of us you know, acting as ordinary citizens, um, you know, I think we've, we focus a lot on social movements and protest um, and driving change that way. But I think the governance part of the equation is not always there for activists. So we need both pieces. We need the uh, organizing for power, building power part, but we also need uh, to organize for governance. Um, and that means really understanding how you drive process through to conclusion. Um, and then the last one comes back to the media environment that somebody asked about, you know, the social contract there. And I think um, if we, um, and I think we, we are all pretty sick of the media environment that we find ourselves in, um, to some extent, we just actually need to break some of our own bad habits and start, you know, rejecting um, the media that doesn't provide us what we need. So, you know, it's been, from my point of view, it's great to see the way in which um, there is a now shifting practice around data settings on websites that you can really reject all the targeted ads if you so choose. Um, there's much more freedom and flexibility there. And I hope, you know, we should all be rejecting that stuff basically. And if we could all reject that stuff, the business model would collapse and we would be on our way to a new media ecosystem. Can you talk about um, at great length, pandemic resilience? What do you mean by that. Well, you know, I mean, it's not really a fancy idea in the sense that at the end of the day, any society wants to be resilient um, in the face of shocks of any kind. And so you might have pandemic resilience, you might have resilience uh, in the face of a challenge like a war. Um, resilience, you know, can come in a variety of different forms. Um, but the point of the matter is just that there are shocks um, of such a significant kind that the biggest challenge is to live through them and survive as the kind of society that you are. And that's what it really means to be resilient, um, to um, master the challenge in a way that you don't um, let it destroy your fundamental way of being. Um, so in that regard, pandemic resilience is um, ensuring that we can manage through a significant crisis um, as a democracy and come out the other end um, with a capacity for democracy, um, you know, even more robust than when we went into the, the, the mess, basically. So, I mean, you, in those early months, you'll remember, there were lots of folks who were basically saying, oh, you know, China's got it right. Autocracy is the way to go. You know, we, this is a moment for recognizing that democracy can't handle crises. So the idea of pandemic resilience was trying to push back against that argument and to say, no, no, the goal here is to figure out how, as a democracy specifically, we navigate through and come out the other end um, with an increased capacity for democracy, not a diminished capacity for democracy. Um, I'm, I'm listening to this. <laughs> I, I laugh, but don't laugh because, um, you know, with regard to not only questions of democracy and the kind of the demos, um, and certain principles um, connected. You've written quite extensively about what we mean by equality, for instance, and also in the Declaration of Independence, but also there are those kind of twin principles of, of, of um, equality and liberty. And I've been particularly struck by, I don't know if it's necessarily the emergence or rather the manifestation of a certain form of 
thinking about freedom that was expressed in the freedom these freedom convoys with regards to the issue of masking and, and, and freedom. Mm. And, um, and uh, I didn't necessarily know if it was appropriate to bring it up, but actually given what you've said, I think it, I think it is because um, I'm very curious what you're thinking about how the phenomena of freedom convoys that yes, there was heavily a focus on Ottawa and Canada and then less so in terms of convoys that have uh, gone in different parts of the world, but they have manifested because ultimately the question uh, that seems to be underlying, even in the naming, is this sense in which what is our kind of relationship to the state um, when there is a crisis or a pandemic, to what degree should citizens or inhabitants of a polity um, uh, live under conditions that may fundamentally um, be antithetical to their view of a certain notion of what does it mean to be kind of free? Don't tell me to mask, <laughs> right? Um, science or no science, um, should that even be a part of the equation? So I guess what I'm asking is, um, because you are talking about democracy in the time of coronavirus, but you all are, are really talking about what does it mean to um, live a democratic life? And with that, there's the part that we broached which is the question of the kind of the equality, but I'm curious uh, with regards to thinking about kind of COVID, the, the freedom dimension. Masking is one manifestation because it's bringing up much of what you talked about, the nature of the parties, right? What types of movements are aligned or de-aligned with, um, with party politics, but movements um, come with different kind of ideological views. But yeah, so that kind of question about um, masking freedom, I think is the larger one about how do we actually wrestle with kind of COVID and uh, the nature of different views about what does it mean to be kind of free in relation to living within a, a democracy, whether a constitutional democracy or an autocracy that, uh, or different democratic states that may not necessarily be constitutional democracies, I, I, I wonder. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I appreciate the question. And, um, you know, I think at the end of the day, as I am trying to talk about a new social contract, um, one of the things I'm trying to do is to reconnect um, the concept of freedom, that you know, individual freedom, to a concept of what we share, political institutions that give us a shared freedom, a shared stability. And um, in that regard, I'm really arguing against uh, the impacts of a very um, pure libertarianism um, over the last 50 years. And I think, you know, pure libertarianism turns into anarchism. And I think that's what we've been watching with the freedom convoys. It's what we've been watching with um, some of the other ways in which people have been um, very aggressive about protesting mask mandates um, and the like. Now, I say that, I do also think there were errors on the other side. So for example, I think it's a significant problem that um, so many of our public entities in the US um, introduced emergency orders without any time horizons on them. Um, an emergency order really needs some kind of information in it about when it ends or what the criteria are for pulling it away. Um, and that was just a kind of consistent mistake that was made over and over again throughout the country. It was just like open-ended um, emergency orders. So, you know, there's room for improvement in terms of how we undertake the kind of public good actions, the public health actions that are necessary and the like, uh, but they need to be defended. They need to be defended as actually what anchors the existence of institutions that make our freedom possible in the first place. So in that regard, um, you know, I do think that, um, you know, the sort of the, the, the influence of a kind of pure libertarianism over the last 30 years is one of our core challenges that requires an answer. Um, looking out beyond, um, you know, kind of beyond the book, um, you, you've laid out, I mean, what's current, either currently or what's next in terms of your kind of thinking or, or even kind of your policy prescriptions for uh, the path, kind of the path, the path forward um, that wasn't necessarily written down uh, in this, uh, in this text, where in terms of a path forward of thinking about um, kind of COVID, thinking about its relationship to democracy, but also what perhaps we might 
need to be most vigilant about. You do lay out those, the kind of those important five prescription, those five kind of major points that the mm -hmm. uh, brings the, the read, you call it read my lips, you know, these kind of different points at the, you know, at the end and, and, and those are wonderful, but, but yeah, um, since you've written this, you know, what are, you know, is there anything in particular you're working on or at least um, wish us to um, really take under consideration as we, as we think about where to go from here, because we've been living, speaking of temporality from 2022, months, weeks, days feel like so much, mm -hmm. they felt so much longer. <laughs> yeah. In terms yeah, of time, sure. time seems like it's slow, you know, it's kind of slowed. And, uh, and the weight of all that, 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 that all of us really are um, kind of wrestling with. So what, you know, what are you thinking now or, or working on now, or even if it's just um, prescription or advice, uh, what do you want us to, you know, Kind of consider as uh, before we um, kind of end our time. So, um, I mean, I, I can, I can. This is an academic setting, so I can share um, the happy news of two forthcoming academic books mm -hmm. uh, that I will call your attention to. So, in April, um, a collaborative volume with others called the "Political Economy of Justice" is coming out from the University of Chicago Press, and um, you know it. it aims to articulate a political economy that would support this kind of vision of a new social contract. Um, so there's that. And then um, I actually have just sent off to the press and coming out next um, spring, um, a book of political philosophy called Justice by Means of Democracy, um, which is my effort to offer a kind of comprehensive account um, of what I mean by a new social contract. Um, it does boil down in some sense to the three principles I articulated, the principle of transformation, which is the commitment to anti-racist principles and rooting out patterns of domination um, in the country in terms of social structure and common practice. Um, a principle of knitting together. Um, so a principle of uh, despite you know, the sort of work of pursuing on domination that we can also connect uh, and build bridges and um, achieve supermajorities that share this commitment to inclusion. Also that that knitting together can be about knitting the three sectors together, um, the public sector, nonprofits, and the market sector. And then with the third principle being of that full uh, participatory inclusion that the people closest to the pain should be close, closest to the power. Um, so those, those three principles are really the kind of core principles um, of the book. Um, but, you know, sort of articulated at scale, basically, in a kind of book of political philosophy. So uh, that's what's coming. Um, and I look forward to sharing them with people and teaching um, and trying to get um, help people, um, you know, take things from this sort of policy agenda that I'm trying to map out here. So my hope is it's helpful. Um, and I'm looking forward to engaging with students to test that out. Okay, fantastic, and congratulations on those books. And I think um, a, a nice way to perhaps um, connect much of what we said together in the book for today, you kind of quote Cicero saying, Salus populi suprema lex esto, that is the approximately the health of the people is the <laughs> supreme law. And there have been different um, interpretations of that since then. Uh, mm -hmm. And so um, hopefully for uh, all of you who are joining us and, uh, that this has been informative in terms of kind of thinking about that. And then also, um, uh, as mentioned in the beginning, for, um, for those who are uh, in kind of Williamstown or happen to find themselves in Williamstown, uh, the W. Ford Schumann Program in Democratic Studies uh, uh, has uh, acquired 150 copies of uh, the book uh, that we wanted to be able to really make available to the community, not just at Williams College, but also local schools and also just members of the community uh, are those who are here. Uh, and so if you would like to have a, a copy of the book, um, then you can um, attain one a signed copy at the, uh, the Williams uh, bookstore. So uh, hopefully you all can thank me uh, in um, uh, joining me in thanking uh, Professor Daniel Allen. And Daniel, this was uh, a real treat, and thank you for taking the time to uh, to share your work, but also uh, help us collectively create a path forward in these times. Thank you, Neil. It was a pleasure. Great to see you as always. So, thank you, everyone. Take good care. Good night.